Hello everyone! What metal do you think was more expensive than gold 130 years ago? If you think about platinum or palladium, you're completely wrong. At the end of the 19th century, aluminum was more expensive than gold, since at that time there was no cheap and easy way to obtain it from its compounds. Nowadays, aluminum is quite cheap because of the discovery of more efficient processes for its obtaining. However, the side product formed by these processes is very hazardous. What is this waste product, and how did it cause one of the biggest environmental disasters in Europe? Well, let's figure it out. By the way, I noticed that the more different sciences I study, the more I understand how interconnected they are. Chemistry and mathematics, physics and biology, computer science and analysis, all these are parts of one big puzzle called science. And the more of these parts you have, the easier it'll be for you to understand the world around us. Therefore, if you love science as much as I love it, then I recommend the Brilliant Interactive Platform. It's a fun and smart game with thousands of educational lessons in math, data science, and computer science. New lessons are added every month, and training is carried out in the format of exciting games with different levels of difficulty. There's so much to be found here. Logic, data science, computer science and programming, artificial intelligence, neural networks, and much more. Study the materials at your own pace, and if things get difficult, you can always use helpful tips. And there are lessons here that'll be useful not only in science, but also in life. For example, in the How Technology Works course, you can learn what makes your password truly secure, and how algorithms understand what content you like. And now is the time to try Brilliant, because it's absolutely free for 30 days. What's more, if you follow my link in the description, you'll receive an exclusive 20% discount for the entire annual subscription period. Explore science with Brilliant. Even though aluminum is the most abundant element in the Earth's crust, obtaining aluminum from its compounds is a challenging task. The production of light and strong aluminum begins with its ore, bauxite, the largest deposits of which are located in Australia. Bauxite itself is often red in color due to iron oxide impurities, but the bulk of it is made up of various aluminum hydroxides with admixtures of silicon oxide or sand, as well as chalk and other unnecessary minerals. The first step in bauxite ore processing is the so-called Bayer process, in which the crushed ore is dissolved under pressure in a solution of alkali or sodium hydroxide at a temperature of 340 degrees Fahrenheit. The process often takes place in opaque containers, but if you try to reproduce it in an ordinary flask, you will see the gradual dissolving of aluminum oxides and hydroxides together with sand in the hot lye while the other impurities form a dark brown precipitate. The reason is that aluminum and its compounds are amphoteric, which means they can dissolve both in acid and in alkali, whereas, for example, iron oxide, or ordinary chalk, don't have such properties and don't react with alkali, thus remaining at the bottom of the flask. After some time of stirring, most of the aluminum hydroxides together with silicone dioxide dissolve in the solution. The resulting mixture is separated into water-soluble compounds, sodium aluminate and silicate, as well as precipitate in the form of iron oxide, calcium carbonate, and other minerals. In order to extract alumina, or aluminum oxide, from the resulting solution, it is simply cooled and diluted with water, whereby aluminum hydroxide precipitates. Afterward, it can be calcined to obtain alumina for the production of pure aluminum. It is also interesting that besides aluminum and silicon, the solution also contains the rare metal gallium. Even though bauxite contains only 500 parts per million, this insignificant amount is enough to produce most of the gallium on Earth as a byproduct of aluminum ore processing. This process leaves behind a lot of hazardous waste, such as iron oxide sludge and sodium silicate solution in alkali with impurities of chromium, manganese, arsenic, and some heavy metals. After drying, this mass is called red mud, and it caused one of the most significant environmental disasters in Hungary in 2010. The fact is, there was a whole lake with red mud, 
consisting of iron oxide and alkaline solution not far from the bauxite ore processing plant in the town of Ashka. The plant was quite large and produced about 700,000 tons of red mud per year, storing it in several reservoirs in the form of small lakes, which dried up and decreased in volume over time. However, in 2010, because of heavy rain, the lake dam was damaged and burst, spilling all of its caustic contents into the streets of a nearby town. About 1,500,000 tons of caustic waste flowed through the streets of the town, staining everything around with red pigment, and also polluted the nearby river, which later flowed into the Danube. I remember the news reports about this case at that time. The Hungarian authorities tried to neutralize the alkaline solution in the local river with vinegar, but their efforts were not so successful. Modern scientists are developing new methods for processing red mud into something useful, because in addition to iron, it contains titanium and silicon compounds, as well as oxide of the rare earth metal scandium, which costs about $12 a gram. To show you the latest developments in this field, I went to Moscow, where my good friend Dmitri is engaged in red mud processing at the Inns of the Ross. Hello, I'm Dmitri Zinoviev a researcher at the Bekov Institute of Metallurgy and Material Science of the Russian Academy of Sciences. My name is Pavel Gordinsky, and I'm a junior researcher at the same institute. Over the last 100 years, the world has accumulated more than 5 billion tons of red sludge, and only less than 5% of it is recycled, which is obviously very little. To avoid the recurrence of the Hungarian catastrophe, we decided to develop a new method of red mud processing which consists in the successive extraction of valuable materials from it. We have been conducting research for the last five years. As a result, we've published several papers in scientific journals. Now we will demonstrate our work to you. To extract useful chemical elements from the red sludge, the mud is first dried so that it can be conveniently handled. After that, they weigh about 12 grams of red powder. Then, the weight amount is compressed under very strong pressure to obtain these tablets, which are much more convenient to work with than loose powder. Of course, in the research stages, the process is time-consuming and limited in quantity, but if this technology finds commercial application, it will be much more extensive. Once the researchers have pressed enough red sludge tablets, they place them in a corundrum crucible that can withstand extremely high temperatures, up to 3,600 degrees Fahrenheit. Carbon powder is poured between the layers of tablets, which can later reduce the iron from the red sludge to a metallic state. After that, the crucible is turned over and put into another crucible with carbon powder, so that the obtained iron doesn't oxidize in the air and the carbon doesn't catch fire. To extract iron from the tablets, the crucible is put in a muffle furnace heated to 1800 degrees Fahrenheit, in which it is calcined for one hour. In the last 10 minutes of calcination, the researchers prepare liquid nitrogen, which will cool the crucible with its contents and prevent the tablets from oxidizing in the air, because if this happens, the whole experiment will be ruined. After an hour of calcination, the crucible heated in the furnace should be cooled sharply in liquid nitrogen. This process looks quite spectacular. In this case, boiling nitrogen displaces oxygen from the container, creating a protective atmosphere in which the red-hot iron doesn't oxidize. After the crucibles have cooled down, we can check what the red sludge tablets have turned into. As you can see, they turned black due to the fact that the carbon allowed the iron in their composition to reduce to a metallic state. It's easy to check with a small magnet. The difference is obvious. Even the first stage shows that it's possible to obtain metallic iron from the residual red mud. The only thing left is to separate it from these calcined tablets. To do that, they're crushed, obtaining a powder of black color. Since the obtained iron is well attracted to the magnet, it can be easily separated from unnecessary impurities of sand and other minerals with the help of a device called a magnetic separator. Of course, it could be done in a homemade way, for example, by simply placing the magnet in another container, 
But in this way, the attracted powder may contain too many impurities that will contaminate the obtained raw material. For a finer separation, it's better to use a so-called wet separator. Under the influence of magnetic forces, it separates the crushed tablets into a magnetic iron concentrate and the so-called tails, which are later simply drained off. This process is quite efficient, as the degree of separation can be adjusted by means of the current applied to the two electromagnets on the sides of the separator. The resulting iron concentrate contains up to 95% metallic iron, which can be used for its intended purpose. For example, it can be mixed with borax and melted in an induction melting furnace to obtain ingots of almost pure iron. These ingots can be used at a steel mill for the production of almost any kind of product, whereas not so long ago, this iron was a worthless waste product. Taking into account that the red sludge may contain up to 65% iron oxide, it is possible to extract up to 500 kilograms of pure iron from a ton of this waste. Sounds quite profitable, doesn't it? It's interesting that besides the iron, the red sludge can also be used to produce titanium and even the rare earth metal scandium which is now added to an aluminum alloy, thus making it several times stronger. To extract titanium and scandium, the tails obtained during the magnetic separation are dried and dissolved in hydrochloric acid, in which the resulting powder is first loaded into a Teflon cup capable of withstanding a very aggressive environment. To leach scandium and aluminum residues out of the tails, the cup is filled with the required amount of 15% hydrochloric acid after which the Teflon container itself is placed in a special steel casing. Creating high pressure and temperature inside it, we'll extract practically all metal compounds soluble in hydrochloric acid from the tails. This process takes up to one and a half hours since the tails still contain up to 5% silicon and up to 0.12% expensive scandium. During this process, aluminum and scandium compounds dissolve in the acid as they have similar properties, while titanium and silicon precipitate. After leaching, the solution is strained through a vacuum filter. The impurities insoluble in the acid are retained, and the so-called mother liquor flows to the bottom. One of the most important compounds of our time, titanium oxide, can be extracted from the precipitate collected on the filter. For this purpose, the precipitate is added to a 17% solution of sodium hydroxide, or alkali, and heated for half an hour. In this case, silicon dioxide, or fine sand, passes into the solution, leaving a titanium concentrate, which can be purified to obtain snow-white titanium oxide. Nowadays, it has many different applications. You can make titanium white by mixing it with linseed oil, or it can be added to toothpaste to make it snow white. In addition, titanium oxide is widely used as an abrasive. And of course, it is sent to factories for the production of metallic titanium. This metal is indispensable in areas where lightness and strength are of great importance. Titanium is as strong as steel, despite being almost two times lighter than it. After the extraction of titanium, the resulting sodium silicate solution can be used to extract the so-called white soot, or silicon oxide, which is often used in construction or medicine. For this purpose, hydrochloric acid is added to this sodium silicate solution, after which silicon oxide precipitates and can be filtered and dried, yielding another snow white powder. Besides construction, it's used for the production of popular sorbents, which are much more effective than activated charcoal in terms of absorbing some toxins from the intestines. It turns out that after calcining the tablets, we have already obtained iron, titanium oxide, and silicon oxide. But this red waste can be used to obtain an extremely rare metal, scandium. The tails after magnetic separation of iron are leached in hydrochloric acid, after which they are filtered under vacuum. But this time, we take not the precipitate, but the solution itself, which flows into the Bunsen flask. It can be used to precipitate aluminum compounds by an unusual process, salting out with hydrogen chloride. To demonstrate this effect, we can assemble the following unusual setup, which I will use to obtain pure hydrogen chloride. For this purpose, I fill one of the flasks with ordinary salt in other words, sodium chloride, and pour concentrated sulfuric acid into the flask through a dropping funnel. As soon as the acid touches the salt, it starts to release hydrogen chloride, which flows through the tubes into the next flask, filling it. And since this gas is quite caustic, its excess is neutralized with the alkali solution. 
To show you how well hydrogen chloride dissolves in water, I turn the flask with the accumulated hydrogen chloride in it upside down, and then blow plain water colored with the methyl orange indicator into it. As soon as a few drops of water fall into the flask with hydrogen chloride, the hydrogen chloride immediately dissolves in it, lowering the pressure in the flask, thus sucking more and more water inside. This effect is also known as a hydrogen chloride fountain. After dissolving hydrogen chloride in water, it turns into hydrochloric acid, at the same time coloring the methyl orange indicator red, thus showing that this solution is acidic. The point is that if there are any salts in the water, they will most likely precipitate, being displaced by hydrogen chloride. This is how aluminum chloride is salted out of the mother liquor when exposed to hydrogen chloride. This is done by blowing hydrogen chloride through a saturated aluminum chloride solution, which gradually precipitates due to the hydrochloric acid formed in the solution. Then, the residues obtained after all these inconceivable extractions can be used for the extraction of scandium compounds. Their amount is not so big, but they are the most valuable. This process is quite difficult and includes extraction with hydrogen peroxide and organic solvents, such as diethyl hexyl phosphoric acid and tributyl phosphate. Scandium forms compounds with them, part of which passes into the upper organic layer and the other part remains in the lower aqueous layer. After separating the upper layer, scandium oxalate can be precipitated from it by adding oxalic acid. To precipitate scandium from the aqueous layer, we should add the usual alkali, sodium hydroxide. As a result, the obtained precipitates can be dried and calcined, obtaining pure scandium oxide, which costs quite a lot, more than 10 euros per gram. From an economic point of view, recycling red mud makes sense only because of the presence of expensive scandium, the general content of which can be up to 0.12%. Yeah, it doesn't sound like that much, but one ton of red sludge can contain up to 120 grams of scandium. It costs about $1,000, which is more expensive than all the other metals that can be extracted from this red mud. Scandium oxide itself can be used for the production of metallic scandium, which has many applications in science and technology these days. Scandium itself is almost never used in its pure form because of its high cost. However, it is utilized as a compound or an additive to other metals. It's used to make super strong alloys. The addition of just 0.2% of scandium to an alloy with aluminum increases its strength by 30%. These alloys are now used to make fuselages for some fighter jets, as well as expensive and super strong aluminum bicycles. In addition, scandium iodide is now used in gas discharge lamps, because after the heating, it glows bright white light, the spectrum of which resembles sunlight. Well, I believe after watching this video, you've learned more about the substance that can cause an environmental disaster and how it can be ecologically recycled to produce valuable metals and their compounds. And if you enjoyed this video, as always, don't forget to give it a like and subscribe to the channel to see many more new and interesting things.